Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. This is the podcast about bringing forward the individuals and interactions that make Agile work. This week, we've brought Llewellyn Falco onto the show. Llewellyn, how are you? Doing great. Awesome. Thanks for joining us from across the pond. Really appreciate it. We know uh, scheduling's difficult and just real happy you were able to make it work out. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a chilly uh, finish day here. We still have snow on the ground. And- also joining us, Amitai Schleier. Amitai, how are you, my good friend? Good as usual. Thanks. Nice to be here. So we've brought Llewellyn on. He reached out after our episode about hiring coaches. And I think at one point he even explained that he was yelling at his screen and as he was listening to the show <laughs> with um with some he just wanted to jump into the conversation. I thought, hey, we gotta bring Llewellyn on. I actually met Llewellyn last year at Agile 2016. He was doing a coding demonstration with David Bernstein. They were watching a quick YouTube video and it was one of the most amazing refactoring uh, sessions that I've ever seen. And I thought, you know, and, and pri- even prior to that, uh, Llewellyn is a, a fixture in the Agile community, uh, one of the most talented programmers that most of us will ever have the opportunity to speak with. And so it was just a real honor that he would, uh, he would reach out and want to talk about this, you know, interesting topic of hiring consultants and coaches, and um, and of course Amitai, being the the backup assistant booking agent to Agile for Humans. Now Don Gray is my primary booking agent, but Amitai certainly is uh, is moving up in the ranks and will and will certainly be uh, perhaps giving Don a run for his money. But you know, Amitai really helped put this together, and and really looking forward to. You know, your guys' thoughts on continuing the hiring conversation and perhaps a few other topics. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the the thing that jumped up in my mind first, there's lots of little things I was going through. Is I'm, I really like to listen to podcasts as as I do, most well, particularly housework, right? So in this particular case, I'm like cleaning my kitchen and, and listening. And, and it's kind of nice because my, my physical body is is busy and my, my mind is, is busy with the podcast. And... One of the things that hit me was the use of the word coach and like, do coaches need to, do agile coaches need to code, right? And, and should you call yourself a coach if you don't, if you don't code? And one of the things, I see this happening in a lot of places where it's words get repurposed. Um, Dan Gilkerson out in San Diego has a term called alternims. I'm not sure if that's his term or not, but the example he used to use was guitars. Like before there was just guitars and then electrical guitars came around. And so now there's also acoustic guitars, right? And they're both guitars, but we had to like add a name to acoustic guitars to make them actually like make sense once they got richer than just the one thing. And and I feel the same way should be with words that you shouldn't like coaches are coaches and you shouldn't take away the meaning of the word coach, but you might need to expand extra words underneath it, right? So rather than changing an existing word, add a new word to be more specific. And it's one of the things that I've done a lot as refer to myself as an agile technical coach, right? Because for me personally, my specialty is and working with teams on technical skills where we are doing coding together. And, and there's a lot of of agile coaching that is not that, and it's equally valid, and it's still coaching. So that that's where it started. And then, as I started like playing with these words, I started realizing that there's a whole bunch of of things that come out of 
of the different types of roles that we hit. So let's start with some some quick roles. So Amitai, how would you describe what you do? Uh, I would say that I orient people in their problem spaces. Oh, oh, that or is, that is less philosophical. consultant speak. <laughs> yeah, it is. I did. I did come up with that after thinking really hard. Like, what's my competitive advantage? It's that I help people orient themselves in their problem space. But I would probably say technical coach or software development coach or maybe technical idol coach. And Ryan, when you work with companies, how would you describe that? So I'm not a uh, technical coach. So I'm more of a I'm just an agile coach. So I, I help companies find dysfunction. And then, and then do experiments to, to seek solutions. And so let's start with, with coaching. Cause I, we, I, so all three of us come under coach. And, and the first thing that I think is when we are actually sitting with a company, are we working on their problems or are we helping them to learn new skills that they will then go back to work on their problems, right? And, and my experience has been that Coaching involves both coaching and training, but training doesn't involve coaching, right? And so just to like unpack that a little bit more, it's very easy for me to go into a company and say, hey, let's learn test-driven development. I'll, I'll set up, maybe I'll set up like Cyber Dojo, or maybe we'll set up like IDs and, and we'll work on something like tic-tac-toe or game of life. That, that is not what they are doing, but it's a place where we can practice, right? And, and this is a very valuable thing. It's something I do a lot. I don't consider it coaching. I consider it training, right? Like we're learning how to to do it. And I, I assume all of us have stuff like that, right? Like, so I, I very often I'm doing some sort of, some sort of, uh, we call them katas, but they're just, it's just a fancy word for exercise where we're learning some kind of skill. Do you, you have stuff like that in your wheelhouses? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's the more experiential you can get with your training and your coaching, the better off you are. So I mean, for us, it's more like simulations. Like yesterday, we went through the beer game with our management staff. I don't think I've heard of the beer game. So Can this you? is a, it's a simulation of taking the, of selling beer, but it's taking from the, the manufacturing to the production to the, to the wholesale to the retail, and then showing how um, delays of fulfilling orders. So it's basically showing the downsides of a push system. And then showing how if you switch to a pull system, uh, throughput and flow improve. But it's also showing them how systems of work impact people and that people perform as well as the system performs. And so it's really those models uh, that I think you're getting at. You know, it's just an exercise in push versus pull, but it forces people to go through some of the motions of moving these these items through the, the assembly line and, and through the the, the process chain, and then suddenly they realize, wow, if this process were better, I would perform better? And that's such a, a yeah. huge mental shift. But yeah, that's just one example of something we do. Oh, I love games for that, too. And in, in fact, there's an entire Agile game conference coming up in Boston, and we were to just do it, because I think so many Agilists like, really see the value in games for, for teaching, and there's a couple things about them that I think are amazing. One is, you know, you get to play a game multiple times, um, and, and so you can try something out and try something out and say, hey, which which strategy is working better? And then the other thing that I really love about games is that's str- like, obviously, we're not like selling beer. Like, that's not what we do. So it forces you to look at that strategy as an abstraction right. and say, how can I take that and apply it to what I actually do do? Right. Whereas. It, it the less of a game it is, the easier is it for to say, well, yeah, that works really good when I'm programming tic tac toe, but I don't program tic tac toe in my day job, you know. Well, it's interesting. So, you, and can, the- you can take some of these delivery areas that we did in the game and map it back to the way that we were delivering software, and then exactly. people, and then but people you have to map it back exactly, and then people start real, realizing, well, wait a minute, if we were to change this here. It would turn it into a pole, and and then those light bulbs start going off, and you get these new ideas, and then we have some experiments to try, and yeah, very powerful stuff. But it's, um, you know, like you said, I it's like doing the hello world. All right, so teach me Python. All right, so here's one line that does that prints out hello world. Well, what did we actually learn? Uh, exactly. How to print a line. It doesn't lead to that next step, you know. And and this goes to another thing that I see 
all teachers are really good at is that retrospective, right? Like all of us are good at, you know, let's do an experience and then unpack that experience so that we can actually learn from it. And basically, if you're not good at that, you don't teach. It's part of coaching, I would say, is, uh, you know, in, in the large, I was I was saying it's about orienting people in their problem space. For me, a more general way of saying it is it's about helping people to see the situation they're in more clearly. And if you're in a training context, but you're coaching minded, what that means is helping people see the learning they just had. That's how they have it. So these are very specialized skills. And I'm wondering, how do you hire for this? Well, uh, and, and how do you use it, right? It's like right. these kind of skills, these were great to bring in someone for a day or, or a week and say, hey, let's come in here and, and train these, these um, skills. And, and, you know, they can be actually quite technical skills or they can be more fuzzy and, and, and humanistic skills. But in either way, like this is bring in someone for, for a very short amount of time, usually a day to a week to do some training. And and that is that's just one dimension of how to use a coach and it, it's a very bad dimension if you want other things to occur in your teams. All right so Amitai, you I know you're working in long term with companies right now. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Can, can yep. you explain exactly what what long term means to you? Uh, a couple different ways. One has been that I'm uh, in with a client team or a set of teams and uh, they have deliverables and, and schedules and they're just looking for some help getting better at it. Uh, another is within a company, maybe that same company, uh, a team that I'm not assigned to is interested in a purpose-specific workshop where it's as though I parachuted in for four days and yeah. gave them a workshop and then left. And for those, to tie back to what we were saying earlier, for those, I prefer to uh, to make it as realistic a work situation as I can. So if we have four days uh, and I'm trying to get them to learn as much as I can in the time that we have, first I want to know what are they interested in learning, what did they try to learn, how did that go, why am I being called in here, of course. Uh, but also maybe for a day we take them out of the team space into a conference room so they can you know snap out of what they're used to and get ready to learn. But as soon as I can sense that they're ready to learn and we don't need the conference space, I want to be back in their team space. So that, okay, so that brings what up we're doing and making it as practical and applied as we can immediately. So that brings up yeah. like a whole another aspect, I think, of of consulting that is is different than training, which is that listening to what's going on in the company, right? And and to be frank, like if I'm only working with the team for a day or or two days, I don't have a lot of time to listen to their problems because like. You know, if I spend a day and a half listening to your problem, then like literally we're going to have very little like time to actually do some training. Whereas if I'm with a company, you know, in a much longer period of time, like two weeks or a month or so I'll just describe a couple working styles in a second. But then I, I have that time to listen. And in that case, if I don't spend the time listening, I can really waste a significant period of time on what I do, right? Like, when I'm training, I want to maximize what happens on those two days or four days that I'm there because I'm not going to be back. But when I'm coaching, I'm really trying to maximize what happens when I'm gone. I'm trying to maximize what the team is doing during the periods where, where I'm gone. So, oh yeah, so one modality of, of working is I'm, I'm with a company and, and effectively, like, I'm just, I'm part of the team, but I'm, I'm just, like, employed in a different way, right? Like my paycheck comes from a different way and, and my term of contract might only be a couple of months, but I'm actually sitting with the team. And I'm, I'm part of the team. Is that, is that the right way that I'm describing what you're doing? Amitai? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. one. And are you sitting with just one team or are you sitting with multiple teams? Usually when it's like that, it's one team. with some proximity to others, but I have one yeah. I'm primarily with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that really is like you're here part of the team right that goes to yet another type of hiring thing of like what i would consider just contractors or which another thing i see go weird in teams a lot is these are people that as as a consultant i can usually not tell if somebody is a contractor or a full-time employee right because they they look almost identical Right in terms of job function, they're they're with the team every day. They're they're working forty hours a week on this team. They've usually been there for you know 
months or years, um, they effectively look like a four-time employee. Sometimes like the color of their badge is different or something. Um, but it can become really confusing sometimes because even though they're effectively just a member of the team, they can be treated very different than a member of the team, especially when it comes to training. Yes. You really like, we're not going to send this half of the team to come learn because we believe that's something like learning is something they should be responsible on their own. Um, my experience has been like, it, you pay for learning whether you do it or not and, and not training part of your team because they're, the way that they receive their paycheck is different is just detrimental to the team. Well, I've even, I've even seen situations where there's an all hands meeting at a, at a different location for a project and they don't want to send the contractors because why would we, why would we have a contractor travel? And it's exactly, it's like, but wait a minute, this person's been with the company for three years now in a contractor role. They're a key member of the team. In some cases, I've seen it where business analysts were the contractor that were not sent to this all hands for a project, and they're the ones that have been deciphering these requirements and working with the the (laughs) programmers and the customer for years, but we're not going to ship them anywhere because they have a different color badge. It's really a bizarre way. As long as we keep saying that they're a team, it doesn't matter that we're creating divisions within them. Right. Yeah. Just keep calling them a team. We don't have to treat them like a team. Because we were calling them a team. Yeah. So, so contractors, they mold in a different way yet again. Um, so there's contracting, there's, the, there's consulting. And under consulting, there's training. And then there's coaching. So, okay. So there's this wonderful lady, Julie Lehrman, out of Vermont. She does Entity Framework. She's super, super good at Entity Framework. If you are using Entity Framework and you have problems, you should bring her into your company. Right? Like She can sort those out. That kind of hire, right? You're you're bringing her in because of her her knowledge and skill with a technology, and like you should be doing that if you are struggling with knowledge and skill in a particular technology. Like a great way to do that is bring in a consultant for a short period of time. Now the question becomes like, what do you want to occur during that time? And I find that most people are like, I have this problem, we want it fixed, and then she will go away. And, don't and make us learn anything, just fix it. Exactly, don't make us learn anything. And, and that, is, that, is a horrible, that is a horrible use, right? Because you're going to continue to use that section when, when she leaves, and if you haven't learned it, it's going to continue to degrade or a lot of times uh, get turned off. Like I've seen a lot of times – consultants or coaches being brought in almost as, as project um, contractors, right? And, and so, like, uh, this is not actually a consultant. This is an intern story that I have. But um, there's a company out here in Finland where they brought in an intern for a whole summer and had them work on automating tests for the GUI, right? And he built a whole suite with the Telerik tool tests. And, and literally, like, a day or two after his intern ship ended and he went away like those tests just got turned off because no one knew how to maintain them and if something's breaking your build and you don't know what to do with it you turn it off like that's it's a very human thing to do right but it's like it was very easy to throw away someone else's work and it, it's more easy to throw away work that you, you know no one's going to yell at you or, or pay attention to or even maybe notice that you threw away so so yeah, if you br- if you bring in Julie and and you you have her fix your problem, but you don't learn how to do it with her, you are wasting money and and a huge opportunity of of absorbing that knowledge that she has. So that's the first thing that that goes in. And for me, you know, as a technical coach, I say like like if I'm working by myself, like I'm just literally wasting your money. Like that's that's the last thing you want to occur. Because you don't want just your code fixed. You want, you want your habits fixed. Like, now, training habits is different than just training knowledge. But both of them come to the same important thing of which you need your team to be like, while they are there, their goal is to absorb that person's knowledge. And, and them working by themselves is, 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 is like a crazy way to do that. 
um, them working in pairs is a pretty good way of doing that. Do you, you do a lot of pairing, don't you? Where you're at, Amitai? Mm-hmm. Yep. Is, is that your primary way of working? It is in the current team, yeah. And, and Ryan, you're doing more on the management side. How are you working with your teams? So when we do any kind of, well, there's different modes. So I'm actually an internal coach. So I'm an, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an employee. So when I'm working with another coach on, you know, coming up with a retrospective for the day, it's always in a pair situation. So we try to pair coach as, as much as possible. Um, so there's so much I love about the way you just said that. For first, the word internal coach, right? Which is, is actually a, an excellent way to hire a coach, right? Like the, <laughs> one of the people I was thinking about was Arlo Belshi, who, who is also a coach and, and just got hired as an internal coach out at Tableau. And, and that is exactly like if your company can, uh, has someone who's good at coaching and can, you know, is, is in a position to bring them in full time, like to do that because that learning is continuous. And, and then the second part you just talked about of not only are you, are you coaching your teams, but you're other also coaching the other coaches. That is also so valuable, right? Because everyone has ideas to contribute and, and to spread. And if, as an internal coach, you are really like given an opportunity to improve the long-term health of your, of your, of your company. There's an upside there where like you're, you're going to be there to live with whatever happens. And yeah. a couple downsides. One is that if you don't have a sense of the clock ticking your own mortality with this company and that they're going to have to live with their own stuff after you leave because you're not planning to leave, then <laughs> you might not be as it. invested in changing those habits. And the other thing that I've seen, uh, and maybe we want to go into this or not, but uh, I've seen it where depending on the health of the company at the time that they hire an internal coach, an internal coach may not be able to be empowered or may not be able to be listened to uh, in the same way that somebody expensive from outside is perceived, even if it's the same exact person. The moment that they switch from being an outside coach to being a, an internal hire, they get listened to differently. So that's a and risk as well. This goes to this maybe another part of hiring, which is support. Right. So I feel like, you know, like if you invest in the stock market, right, basically like you, you pay some money, you get some stocks and then it's out of your hands how those stocks perform. Right. It's, it's a very just I, I, I spend my money. There's nothing I can do. Right. And I feel like sometimes managers treat employees and coaches in the same way as like, hey, I, I'm paying your salary at this point, like you should be providing value to me sort of regardless of what, what happens next. And, and that nothing could be further from the truth, right? Like once you have an employee, what you then continue to do with them dramatically changes on how that investment pays off, which is why like, you know, like whole conversations around like little amenities, like, like free lunches and stuff like that can like yield big returns, things like hardware and computers huge, huge returns, right? Like usually the difference between suitable hardware and, and good hardware is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 500 to a thousand dollars a year. And, you know, that can return so many times on this. You make this have back of, in a couple of days. Yeah. Of like 80 to $160,000 that you're playing for an employee is, I mean, it's just, it's crazy not to do that in order to think that they're going to be able. They're going to return the same value on their salary with with computers that are barely working versus computers that work really well. Um, and then the same with the support, right? So you said maybe the company isn't in the place right now to to, to take it. And I think you need different types of coaches for different places of a company, um, but also that support. And then, so one example I have of this is learning hours. So if you hire a coach, I think, you know, there are specific things that they can teach you on what you're doing, right? But all, like literally every coach I know has some really genius training stuff that they should be sharing with you, right? And, it, and if you block out like a week or two and say like, hey, train us this whole time. Like most people who are coaching can do that, but it's a really bad way of absorbing that knowledge. 
Uh, whereas if you take like an hour in the morning each day or an hour in the morning every other day and do a, a learning hour, you can disseminate a lot more. And, and much more importantly, the people who take those trainings can actually absorb and retain a lot more of what what goes because there's a big difference between what what a teacher puts out there and what a student remembers two weeks later. Um, and, and so a lot of coaches I know will do some sort of learning hours or, or lunch and learns or book clubs or, you know, like do some sort of things like that with the team because they want to seed new information onto their teams. But it's very easy for people not to go to these events because they are almost always voluntary. Right. And w what that means is the manager will yell at you if you don't get your task done, but they're not going to yell at you if you didn't go to the lunch and learn. They're not going to yell at you if you miss morning learnings. They're not going to yell at you if you don't go. Like so many places have user groups, which are phenomenal in their own businesses, like at their own companies. They literally just have to walk downstairs, and they miss those. And and a lot of times they miss them because they're after hours, and you know it's a choice of do I go to this extra meeting or do I get to see my kids tonight? And that's you know that no one can blame me for making that choice. Um, but that's another type of support of the manager saying like what's really important to me and is is my team getting better at what they do is that something i want to actually put my my money where my mouth is well if you're trying to build a culture of learning which i think is one of the new uh the new models that companies are going for you don't wait till after hours to have a learning event i mean i think that's exactly. rule, that's rule number one of a learning culture yeah but what I've found, too, is that not only are the, those office hours, learning hours, book clubs, lunch and learns are important, when you're actually doing a focused um, training or consulting and you have someone, someone like you, Llewellyn, in for a week or two, what I've found, too, is that if you can do a quick, not even necessarily a quick, but a daily retro on what you got out of the day. And so, yeah, yeah. We, we, do the, we do the hour of learning in the morning, we do the retro at the end of the day. It creates that alignment, and it helps you have intent. And I think that's really important for managers to understand as well, that when you have someone like Llewellyn or Amitai in your shop, you're getting very high-end coaching for a very specific, focused amount of time. And if you're not intent, if there's no intent behind it, if you're not actually inspecting and adapting regularly on what they're doing, you're not going to teach your team how to be more like Llewellyn or Amitai you're going to get a little more output and that's not nearly as valuable. Yeah. Yeah. It's that habit in the, all right. So like, I, you know, I'm, I'm older. Uh, I've never really been that in shape. One of the things I've done a lot is I've, I've hurt my back, right? Uh, usually my lower back. And at one time I hurt my back so badly that like I, I really was forced into this idea that like stretching really helps. So first of all, if, if you're listening to this podcast and your lower back helps stretch and just, like literally like touching your toes types of stretching, right? Like stretch out your hamstrings. But as soon as my back stops hurting, I stop stretching because that is not part of my discipline. That's not part of my habits. It's just me responding to pain. And, and so often I see people hiring consultants in response to pain, like this thing isn't working well, like I'm in a lot of pain, come help get me out of pain. And the moment they get brought out of pain, they're like, okay, now you can go home. <laughs> right. But you have, when you, when you have someone there, like you can help build those habits in your team and learning culture is, I mean, all of culture is habit. Right. And, and one of the huge advantages of having somebody who, who already has those habits is if you put support behind them, they can start to do it repetitively enough with your team that your team starts to pick up those habits, right? So if you, if you get into the point of saying, hey, let's look at what we did today and say, you know, I mean, a, a standard retro is, is what, so what, now what, right? So what do we do today? Why does that matter? And how are we going to use that to correct our course tomorrow, right? And and those retros don't take a lot of time, but the habit of actually doing it regularly really makes a difference on little, little course corrections that add up being huge wins, you know, not today and, and not tomorrow, 
but over over you know months and years of working together those those little things snowball into huge results the retro is so critically important to me it's actually turned into a question that I ask when interviewing coaches, whether it's for internal or external. This started, the search for a question started when uh, a group of coaches, we were um, doing our, our weekly lunch. So we, we gather as a, as a coaching team over a lunch uh, and just discuss various topics and uh, whiteboard and, and work together on, on various things. And something we've always talked about is, you know, for an engineering uh, interview, there's fizz buzz. Right. There's the, the old fizz buzz question. On, yeah, that's a great interview question, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. But what is the fizz buzz question for an agile coach? And that, that was a question that we posed in one of the lunches. And it really got our, our, our brains kind of turning. And we landed on it's a two part question. And so we couldn't we couldn't get it down to one yet. But if there's any listeners out there that have any ideas, leave some comments in the show notes, because this is actually uh, really critical, I think, to hiring a, a coach is getting down to the kind of questions that, that reveal habit, uh, as Llewellyn yeah. and, and Amitai have been to talking about. But the question we came up with was a two-parter. Uh, the first part of it is, uh, and this is assuming a scrum context for this discussion, but of all of the agile ceremonies, whether it's a scrum team or not, which one is most important? And so, as... Uh, as a coach, I'm looking for the answer to be retro. I want to hear the answer of retro. However, if it's not, we can still have a conversation and figure that out. But when they answer retrospective, which I've had a number of coaches answer that, answer that the follow-up question is, tell me three different types of retrospectives that you perform and, how they, and what purpose you use each one. And so really what I'm trying to get at is, if this is the most important ceremony that you've taken the time to invest in learning multiple ways to conduct it, and you understand that, they are, that there are different retrospectives for different purposes. And if they can actually explain that, to me, that is a good sign, and the, and the conversation should continue. What do you guys think of so, that? I, I don't like multiple choice questions in interviews because I always feel like, like they're very gotcha-y, which is not what I want. Kind of thing, but um, it just I love fizz buzz as a thing. I would actually suggest doing effectively the fizz buzz of take your coach and say, "Okay, you've got you got twenty minutes. Take us through a retro, right? Let's just experience them them giving us a retro." Uh, because I agree with you, the retro is really important, and and I think there's um, it's easier to get uh, let, let's say um, conned by someone saying what's important on a retro, retro rather than actually what they do. So if you put them up there and actually just watch them do a retro, you'll know right away, like, did that go well or did that not go well? And you might not be able to articulate exactly why, but you will be able to articulate it did or it didn't. I'd also be interested to hear uh, if their answer is something other than retro. Mine, mine would also be retro, but I'd be curious to hear why. If they had something else in mind, and that is uh, how they explain that, how they justify that, and that is yeah. a that is a follow up question when they go away from retro, and it's not really, you know, I, I totally see the gotcha trap that this question could lead to, but it, what it really does is foster a conversation, and so if the the second most popular answer, unfortunately, is the daily stand up or the daily scrum, what I start digging in there. So when that answer comes up, I think there are a few good reasons for that. So when they talk about, and I've had a few different answers to the follow-up question of why that one is. And what a lot of people talk about is, well, it's a great way for the team to maintain alignment. Like, okay, so let's talk through that. That's actually an interesting topic. Now, when it, ter when it starts revealing command and control type habits and behavior, that's when we start that's when you start getting a little nervous about the, the candidate. But for the most part, it's one of two answers. It's either retro or stand up. And then depending on the answers, I mean, the interviews still go fine. I like Llewellyn's idea of just turning the interview into a retro, you know, huh. think, think over the last, you know, three or four years of your, of your career, what went well, what didn't, and now what, or, or try to frame it in a way that, that it has some kind of context. Or bring your team team in and just make them do a retro on what happened today or what happened yesterday. Or absolutely, I mean, 
when you get with this rando off work, the street that you've never met before. Yeah, have them have them facilitate. Uh, so okay, like I will say, all right, like you bring Diana Larson in and say, will you do a retro for twenty minutes on what happened to us yesterday? That <laughs> Diana will like blow your mind, right? You'll be like, holy cow, why aren't we doing this? Why don't we have more of this on our team, right? And and again, like not obviously not everyone's going, nobody's going to be Diana Larson other than Diana, but. Like you will get to see how are they at, at diving in and, and like pulling insights out of your team. And it doesn't have to be that this is the best retro ever, but you will get a very clear idea of what they're like. Right. And so, yes, there's constraint, but same with Fizzbuzz, right? Like I don't ever care about Fizzbuzz. Right. And, and I don't even really care that you solve Fizzbuzz. Um, I care to see you working. It's, it's seeing you mm-hmm. work is, is where I'm going to make the thing. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's literally auditioning, right? Like it's, you don't bring in musicians and say, tell me about your music. It's like, play something for me, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, if I'm going to, if I'm going to retro the idea of doing a retro as a kind of an interview for a coach, I would keep the idea of, uh, put them in some kind of a work situation and I might change it from being a retro specifically. So one time that I was auditioned by a client, um, they had a very thorough audition process and it was kind of a role-playing game where uh, one of them would play the role of a particular character who was a distilled, stylized, you know, real situation that they had seen. Uh, somebody else, as needed, would be a confederate, like a manager or a scrum master or what have you. Uh, and they would pose some real challenge, like, I'm so-and-so. Uh, I don't think that I have time to test drive the story, and so I don't want to do it. Yeah. Go. You, what do you actually say? What do you actually ask when they respond the way that they actually respond? Let's see it. It's not quite as good as getting in there with them. Uh, and I think, you know, just like FizzBuzz can be misleading about a programmer compared to actually working with them for a sprint. I think the same thing for a coach, but it still gives you a datum about whether you would want to work with them for a sprint. Exactly. And so I would vote like, maybe not a retro because the people on the team would have so to have actually, quite a lot of safety to, to work with a random outsider like that. I know a story of this. Anything, yeah. Uh, a Go friend work. of mine, Michael Glassing, out in Florida, just went through a situation where they did that in an interview where they, they brought him in and said, do a retro and let us let's see what it's like for retro. And, and you, you know, he was like, you know, it's intense and it's, it, it's a little bit scary, but... But you get a really clean idea of, of what that person's like to work. And, and uh, I mean, I'll be clear, like we're making these thin slice judgments, right? But we're going to do that anyways, right? We're, we're going to thin slice everyone we talk to based on, on things that we don't get access to. At least having it be around work makes it much more likely that we're, we're making presumptions around something that we actually care about for work uh, rather than just – do I like you? Did did I like the way you talked or your accent or the way you made I kind of like or rather than like these other very misleading thin slices, at least we have the chance of those thin slices being accurate or, or relevant. Well, and if you mm-hmm. involve your teams, because yeah. this person's actually going to be coaching your teams, at least it gives the team the insights and the ability to to raise questions and, and, and throw the flag. Because these are the people that are actually impacted, and these are the people that you're trying to, to help. I think if we're talking about that, that thin slice judgment, if we could go a step further and design what is a good process for hiring a developer or hiring a coach, because I think it's the same idea, we have to make these snap judgments that have relatively long-term implications. What if we could say, what's your rate? Is that within our range? Can we have you for a few weeks? Well, and almost together, all coaches... Happens are willing to do that kind of thing. It's usually the on the manager side where they're right. taking a, a slower side. Although this also goes to okay, this goes to a couple other things. One is do you hire one coach or or multiple coaches? And and one of the things that I don't see very often is is companies actively reaching out to say like, hey, let's bring in in two coaches to see what happens. Uh, because they're like, well, I got, I have someone who does that. A lot of the stories of where great stuff shows up is when two really talented people got together and got to work together on the same problem. In fact, all of extreme programming came out when it's like, hey, we got a couple really smart people together on the same project, and look at what what came out of that. That's something I wish happened more. That you, you know, like, and, and I know that 
coaches will actually talk to each other about that, right? Like, like I have been been wanting very, very much to get an opportunity to work with with Michael Feathers on a project, or or Emily Bach out here in Sweden, or or Arlo out in Seattle. Like, I'd love a chance to actually get to do it. And it's hard because all of us are, are very talented. We're very expensive. Um, most of the time when people are like, why would I bring in two of you to solve my problem? And the answer is, if you bring in two of us, you might not just get your problem solved, but you might be there where something completely new is getting birthed. Um, you know, because, because otherwise you're going to reach into your bag of tricks rather than, you know, maybe create some, some brand new tricks. Woody Zool, you know, they, they, they brought him in as an internal coach and and because they gave him like quite a lot of, of leeway on what he did, like mob programming came out of that, and I mean it was it was re- remarkable. And again, it's that it's that we're not bringing you in to build you know a project and go. It's we're we're bringing you in to grow and garden something great. And and coaches are usually people who have sort of excelled up through their careers. And and bringing them in and giving them a place to do that is is a really valuable. It's an expensive thing to do, but it's a it's a really valuable thing. And we just see time after time of places where this this has occurred. The other thing I want to talk about: we talked a little bit earlier about like not working alone or pairing. Uh, I didn't mention mobbing, which I think is a a really useful for me. It's the predominant way that I coach because I am usually trying to transfer knowledge. Again, like I think. It, with coaches and, 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 and consultants, the goal is how do I suck as much knowledge out of them into my teams as possible, as quickly as possible. And, and with coaches, that it also goes to habits. How do I suck as much knowledge and habit into my team? And, and mob programming is an excellent way of, of doing knowledge transfer. It's just, it, it reminds me like, you know, for a lot of part of my career, I worked by myself, and then I, I discovered pair programming around 2003, and that was just such, you know, it was just an entire level of of learning that I I got to go up. And I feel like mobbing was that step up from pairing again, right? Where it's just, you know, another order of magnitude of of learning, and and so for me, it's a very very useful way of working. Also, because we were doing technical work, a lot of times the details become blockers. And so having the team together becomes really useful to remove those blockers so we can actually do these new processes, right? Where it's very easy to get blocked with an individual. Um, you get unblocked because everybody's there to hash it out real quick. We're there because everyone's there or we're there because the right person is there at the exact right moment to contribute their little piece of the puzzle that allows the whole, whole thing to come into completion. Um, mm-hmm. But the the blocking goes away, or sometimes we get unblocked because the team is there with the courage to say, "Let's do this." Rather than you can convince one person, and then you have to spend another fifteen minutes convincing, you know, another person, and then another. And by the time you've actually convinced the whole team, like you're, the whole thing is dead, right? So having the team there also brings a, a fair amount of courage. Which I think it really also uh, encourages kind of. A certain kind of involvement, a uh, certain kind of investment by the team in their own environment, because when there is any kind of an impediment, whether it's external or some little thing that they wish there was automated, when the entire team gets slowed down by it, the entire team wants to do something about it. And so you yeah. find that those impediments, whether again, whether they're externally imposed or just part of the flow of the work, get smoothed out. And people feel engaged in the fact that if anything slows us down, we should fix it because we don't want to go slow and we don't have to. And we've fixed many of these before. Now, Llewellyn, there's an excellent conference coming up that I think you're participating in where people can actually learn how to mob. Is that correct? Absolutely. The mob programming conference is coming up in Boston. It's actually uh, back to back with the Agile Games conference. So um, it's early, uh, early April. If, if you're in the area or you, if you can make it out, if you have not mobbed before, or if you are mobbing and you just want to share and, and help everyone uh, to learn new tricks and to do it better. It's weird. When when you're good at stuff, I find you learn less at conferences, but what you learn you can do more with. And when you're new to stuff, there's a whole bunch of low-hanging fruit, so you learn just a ton of stuff. But, of course, you're, you're you know, like your ability to actually wield what you learn is, is not as, as good. 
Um, but but either way, the Mop Program Conference is fantastic. It's two days out in uh, in Boston, in Cambridge. And if, if you can make it out, please make it out. Yeah, it's April 6th to the 7th uh, out in Cambridge, as Llewellyn said. Um, it yeah. looks like they've, I think they secured um, Richard Sheridan from Menlo as, yeah. the, as the keynote speaker. Uh, he's Him the author and of... Woody Zool, the yeah. guy who created. Yep, so... <laughs> The author of Joy Inc., uh, Richard Sheridan, is keynoting along with Woody Zool. So Woody's a good friend of the show. He's been on a number of times. It is, I think it is the event that if you have been curious about uh, mob programming, if it's something that you've been on the fence on, or if it's something that you've decided, I absolutely have to learn this, I think this is the conference for you to attend. You're going to have uh, Llewellyn, like I said at the beginning of the show, one of the most talented programmers you could ever work with. Woody, the inventor of, of mob programming. Uh, I think this is the collection of people that uh, that can get you on your way. And this is a very hands-on conference, so it, it it's it's almost two days of workshops, right? Like you will be mobbing the whole time, and and you get to try a whole bunch of things. If if anyone is considering going to this conference to learn about mob programming, uh, I also have started designing learning environments specifically when I have a workshop. It's always mob programming these days. Uh, if you're on the fence about whether that seems like it could be worth it. There's an Agile in Three Minutes episode, number 32, about mobbing. You can take three minutes and listen to what it might be like. Uh, and I just highly recommend, if you have a chance, to see what it's like in person for a couple of days. This conference will be very good for you. So I also want to bring out a different modality of working, which is one-on-ones. Right? And, and so one of the things I see, and, and like someone who I think is really good at this, again, is, is Heidi. Uh, who, who's a, like a, she does a lot of coaching with teams and and getting you know like is a is a counselor like the right term for this i think you're um, talking about heidi heflin right uh but heidi heidi is really good at having a one-on-one with somebody a a lot of times she'll like take them on a walk or or take them out to lunch or like i find my lunches are a really important part like if i'm eating lunch alone at a client i'm really not doing my job but being able to have that space where you can connect with people and, and multiple people in the company and establish trust and establish a dialogue so that things will start to come out, right? And, and there are people who are really good at like establishing that trust and that connection with you so that you can get alerted to, hey, there are these problems or these opportunities or like sometimes they look the same um, that that show up. And in having that ability to make one-on-one connections, not just with an individual in the team, but individuals across different teams in a company, that's a really huge, huge benefit. Um, and again, there are there are coaches uh, uh, like Heidi uh, Barbara Weilers is also another one like that, and and they have that ability. If you bring them back over time, right? Like that doesn't you can't do that for a week because you need a place where it's like. We go out to lunch one week, and we do we do another one on one the next week, and, and the week after that, and then like after that's been established, things start getting alerted to you, right? So you need those people to be on site, and be on site, you know, consistently over time, or at the very least, uh, repetitively over time, so that that you can bring that part up. And sometimes maybe it's a little safer to confide in a coach or consultant who you know, maybe has less stake in the politics, someone who is not trying to get your job, someone who is, you know, there's an advantage in that. Certainly agree. And I think at this point, um, that's a great place for us to stop for this conversation. But Llewellyn, I just wanted to say, you know, thanks for joining us. I think we could probably do 10 more episodes (laughs) and still not get to the bottom of this. So I hope that, uh, as we get more feedback from the listeners that you and Amitai would be willing to come back and perhaps dig into some of their questions. Cause I think we're going to generate a ton of questions with this episode. I would, I'd love to come back and, and dig into more of these questions. I think this is a really rich and complicated subject. Oh, certainly. And so at this point of the show, uh, I'd like to open it up to, to the guests. And if there's anything that you want to get in front of the listeners, now is your time. Um, if, if you're open to continuing the discussion, how they can reach out, whether it's on Twitter, website, anything like that. So Llewellyn, the floor is yours. Uh, what should our listeners know about? So the thing that I've been thinking about a lot right now is if you're struggling with your team, 
go to your boss and lobby them to send one of your teammates to a conference. Or like often we go to conferences and we get inspired and we come back and we're like, hey, team, team, let's do this stuff. And the other team is like, I don't want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> we're, 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 you know, our, our day-to-day is working. If you go and say like, hey, you know, Mary has never been to a conference or, you know, Bob hasn't been to a conference in three years. And you go to your boss and say, can you send Mary to a conference? Like, it'd be really good if, if she gets a chance to go and see, see an Agile conference. Or it'd be great if Bob gets a chance to go and, 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 and check out Strange Loop. Like, then they'll come back with ideas. And then you can just, like, help each other out. Right? So get that insp- – like, conferences add a lot of inspiration. They also – they expand your vocabulary a lot, right? Like, it's very easy for someone – to you know, if you if you go to someone who's been to a conference and say like, what do you think about Docker? You know, maybe they like it, maybe they don't. Maybe they're like, I haven't had enough experience with it. But what you don't get is what's Docker, right? If you go to people who haven't had a chance to to get out in in the last five years or have never been to a conference, they most of the time won't be able to answer that question. And and that's so powerful. So rather than going to your boss and saying like where are you going to send me, right? Which they can very be like, what vacation are you trying to get me to pay for? Like when you go to them and say, help my teammates get there, it's much easier for them to look at it a little more critically and be like, you're right. Like I'm not bringing, I'm not bringing new ideas. I'm not growing my team right. So think about your teammates and, and get them out so that they can learn and that will come back and make it better for you. And so, Llewellyn, if the, the listeners want to reach out, uh, can you give Twitter, website, those kind of things? Twitter is the best way to find me. Uh, it's Llewellyn Falco on Twitter. Uh, fairly unique internet name is always very helpful. <laughs> um, I, you, know, uh, you can find me on GitHub a lot if you're interested in any of the open source stuff that I've done, like approval tests. Um, and I'm at conferences all the time, and, and I'm a big believer in pairing and mobbing, so like, I am very, very open to you know, pull. Let's pull out our laptops and actually work together. If you see me, if you see me anywhere, like I'm, I'm good at that. And if you don't see me anywhere, I'm good at doing that on Skype. So reach out directly. Uh, Twitter is usually the best way to make contact, or LinkedIn is another great way to make contact. But once we go from there, it's very easy to like connect on Skype, and 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 connect that way. All right. So I will get links. I'll vouch to- for that. It's it is fun to remote pair with Llewellyn. Thanks. Very cool. And I actually, I'll vouch for seeing him do that at a conference. So it was a lot of fun to watch that too. So I'll get links to all of that stuff about Llewellyn in the show notes, along with the mob programming conference so that people can check all of that out. Uh, Amitai, what have you got? What are you peddling these days? These days, uh, Agile in three minutes is back. I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, so 32 about mob and, um, you can otherwise get me on Twitter at Schmanz, or my website is schmanz.com. Uh, Llewellyn, I believe I'll be seeing you in Boston a couple weeks after the Mob Programming Conference at the Agile, Agile Alliance Technical, Technical Conference. Conference. So that's coming up uh, in mid to late April. And uh, Agile Coach Camp in New York. And Big Apple Scrum Day presenting with Ryan. Maybe you can tell them about that one. And right after that, Agile and Beyond in Ann Arbor. And that's it for me. Yeah, so Amitai and I got a talk accepted at Big Apple Scrum Day. We're talking about the care and feeding of T-shaped people. And so it's an interesting adventure and journey on how, uh, how to grow T-shaped skills. And, and how nice. our pads there and, and how you can both grow your own and support others. And it's just a, I think it's going to be an interesting talk around some of the experiences. And I hope it's interactive. I hope we actually get a lot of questions from people on, on what it what T-shaped really means and how to apply that to their lives and should be a very, uh, very good talk. So very excited about that. Uh, first time I get to co-present with Amitai. So we're going to pair, we're going to pair present. So we're, we're bringing pair pairing to the, the conference level. I absolutely, I love pair present. I just gave a, a keynote in London, uh, yesterday actually, or Monday. Um, where we did it in pair. I love pair presenting. Uh, the thing that I really love is those are, you know, there's two kinds of, of presentations with two people. And one is a presentation that really should be a one person presentation that two people do. And the other is a presentation that requires two roles that you can't do, right? Like you can't do who's on first, what's on second with one person. Like that's, that's not a thing that can happen. And so I love those, those in, in, 
knowing both of you, like I, I feel very confident, like saying that, like that you guys can give a presentation together that just is impossible for one of you to give by yourself, and and those are just usually magical. Well, I was going to read slides one through five, and Amitai was, <laughs> Amitai was going to read. But, but now Amitai, I think Llewellyn's raised the bar for our words. talk. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Actually, we're, uh, that's good from index cards. Yeah, I guess index cards will we'll switch. No, I, I agree with you. We're, we're going to try to give the kind of talk that only two people could give, and I, I really hope that the people in New York enjoy it. So other than that, uh, at Ryan Ripley on Twitter... The website is ryanripley.com. Uh, I have a my speaking schedule is growing. I'll get it posted in the show notes. So I know a lot of the Agile for Human listeners, they love coming up and saying hello. Some of them are worried that it's weird. I got some of that feedback that one one person, especially he he approached me and said, "I hope this isn't odd, but I like your podcast." And I'm like, "No, this is the best thing I've heard all day." <laughs> so when you when we put things out in the world, you know, Llewellyn puts out a lot of YouTube videos about some of his programming adventures, Amitai, Agile in Three Minutes, me with Agile for Humans and writing on various sites. We love the feedback. It actually helps yeah. us learn about what's, what resonates, what doesn't, you know, what hit, what missed. Um, so please come up and say hi, talk to us. Uh, we're just, if we're at a conference, we're just another attendee just like you. It's totally not weird. And we love uh, hearing what you think about our work. So... Uh, really looking forward to those opportunities. Uh, but other than that, guys, we broke another download record last month. Every month is a new record in downloads for the show. I know, it's amazing. Uh, really happy about that. So what that means is you, the dear listener, you are sharing the show uh, and really appreciate that and just love the fact that you're out there. And I can't thank you enough. So with that said, Llewellyn, Amitai, really appreciate the talk around coaching, consulting, hiring, mobbing, pairing, you know, all of these things. Uh, looking forward to the next time we get to do it. And uh, to the listeners out there, thank you for listening. Thank you for being there and, and have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.